Hello. Uh, sorry, some technical difficulties. This is my first time hosting. Uh, I'm taking over from Matt Fay, um, who's usually here, and today I'm being joined by Jameson Lopp, uh, who doesn't really need much of an introduction. Um, this space is going to be talking about um, the, well, self-custody and how to make it safe. So the reason that we've invited Lop to join this space, and Jameson, sorry, is <laughs> a habit to call him, call him Lop, um, is because we want to kind of give a unbiased introduction to the idea that you can self-custody your coins um, without the need to be a complete expert um, and what the best way to go about it is. So, um, hi, Jameson, maybe I can just check that your mic is working. All right, I think it is. Yeah, perfect. Um, so the format of this space will be, I've prepared some questions for Jameson and um, hopefully they will be uh, a good starter to get us talking about what it takes um, to, to self-custody and how, how we go about understanding self-custody. So during the course of this, um, I'll be letting some other people up to, to, to speak. So if you have something to say, something to ask Jameson, um, feel free to request and I will let you up one by one. Um, so to kick it off, let's just start with um, Jameson, would you please just introduce yourself and your work and how you see your work uh, today? Sure. Uh, so I am a computer scientist by trade. I spent the first 10 years of my career doing fairly standard uh, software as a service web applications, uh, specifically in the email marketing industry, where um, over the years I worked my way towards the back end of basically doing large scale distributed data processing. And so uh, suffice to say, I was doing almost the antithesis of a lot of what I do and preach today, which is that I was uh, ingesting petabytes and petabytes of raw tracking data and uh, helping companies uh, basically figure out what their customers were doing in order to try to better target and sell stuff to them. And so that was never um, a passion of mine. It just provided some very interesting technical uh, scaling challenges. And of course, over that period, I really came to learn just how much surveillance really happens uh, as you're going about your day using the internet. So um, eventually I became interested in Bitcoin about 10 years ago. I started a few side projects. I forked Bitcoin Core, um, not as a, a you know, different protocol or a different network or token, but rather the actual software um, puts a bunch of instrumentation logic into it to try to help people better understand what the actual Bitcoin nodes were doing. And that was just the beginning of what has turned into many different projects. Um, eventually, I was fortunate enough to go full time in 2015 and spent three years uh, building infrastructure for BitGo. Uh, that's when I really got deep into self custody and private key security and multi signature aspects of these protocols. And um, that was really focused on helping enterprises secure their hot wallets, which is a big challenge in this space. As we all know, there's uh, been quite a history of large custodians getting hacked and losing lots of money over the years. So BitGo's primary goal while I was there was to help prevent future huge hacks. Um, didn't have a 100% success rate, but we did learn a lot and kept getting better and better over the years. Uh, unfortunately, when it comes to security, a lot of the lessons have to be learned the hard way. And after doing that for three years, made a very small pivot to basically do the same thing, uh, use multi-signature functionality within these protocols to help self-custody, but instead I decided to focus on helping individuals do that because I felt like there was still a huge gap, a huge amount of knowledge that was required in order to, to do self-custody really well. And so I, I just wanted to make that easier, more accessible for people. And at CASA, we have been providing multi-sig solutions now since 2018. And actually, Trezor is one of the building pieces 
that we use on our platform. And I've been using Trezor devices myself since I think 2015 or so. And uh, we felt like in order to help people self-custody, you know, especially if you're talking about non-trivial amounts of money, the very first thing you have to do is get those private keys off of internet connected devices. And so Trezor has been, um, you know, a great uh, piece of hardware over the years to help people do that. And we're, we're very uh, fortunate to be using it and other uh, similar pieces of hardware to build out you know, robust software to help people tackle this problem. And it is a giant problem. I think we'll go into uh, a lot of different aspects of that. Great. Um, so it sounds like you've kind of found a greater and greater motivation as you've twisted your original um, uh, experiences um, in, into Bitcoin and channeled it more and more towards the individual. Um, is, would, would you say that it's a big motivation for you to help um, people self-custody? Um, do you feel like it's a, a personal mission of yours? Or? Yeah, it's, um, it's weird because you know, this space is crazy complicated. Like over the past 10 years, the, the ecosystem around these technologies has exploded in complexity. And there is uh, countless different teams and projects and people that are exploring all types of different things that you can do uh, with this technology. And, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's at the point now where even I or you know someone who is full time in the space cannot possibly keep up with all the different directions that things are going, and you know for the past uh, six years now, I've been focused on pretty much the same old boring thing, which is just trying to keep these tiny amounts of data, these private keys, safe and 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 make it easier for the average non-technical person to do that. And it, it may not be the most exciting and glamorous thing. It's certainly not something that's easy to you know, market, but I feel like it is fundamental that we continue to improve this and we have to get it right. Otherwise, all of the other cool and crazy stuff that's being built on top of private key uh, you know, cryptographic technology is is not going to work, or at least it's not going to work at a mainstream level. We need for people not only to you know, have the theoretical ability to self-custody and be their own banks, we need for people to be comfortable and confident that they can do it uh, and you know, not be worried about making one mistake and having a catastrophic loss. And you know, it's a personal problem, too. Um, I think anyone who has been in the space long enough probably has some stories of, of either you know loss or theft or something that has gone wrong. I mean, uh, I was actually just making a transaction, I think, last weekend and, and realized like two seconds after I broadcast the Bitcoin transaction that I, uh, I had one of the outputs off by an order of magnitude. Thankfully, I was able to do a you know, replace by fee and fix my mistake uh, you know, before it got uh, confirmed in the blockchain. But that's just the type of thing that I'm talking about is that um, you know, I was using a single signature wallet for that, and I was just being slightly uh, less careful than I should have been. And that it could have ended up being basically a, a thousand or multi-thousand dollar mistake if I hadn't then caught it within a few uh, seconds. So, you know, this, the, I think the underlying theme to all of this, this whole space, self-custody, self-sovereignty, all of that, is that it has great potential and great power uh, that the functionality offers to mankind, but this also comes with great responsibility and unfortunately, in many cases, uh, great brittleness, you know, basically a lot of potential for people to make a single mistake and have something go terribly wrong. So there's, there's, there's still just so much left to do that I have not gotten bored uh, remaining focused on this very low level problem. That is great to hear. Um, I think people kind of overestimate the glamour behind cryptography. Um, they, they see these private keys as some uh, mathematical uh, mecca. Um, 
whereas the the, the trouble is it's it's literally just a string um, and people don't really see it as something that they can tangibly protect. Um, but I, I think you also touched upon a point is that most people have had this experience where they've lost some money to um, to a oversized fee or they've they've actually been scammed um, out of their their private uh, out of their recovery phrase. Um, and there's not the holistic approach to security. I think that's something that's missing. Um, people don't expect to perhaps be be swatted like something that happened to you uh, in the past or um, having their their sim swapped and so on and so they don't see these as attack vectors um if we can go back to that um part of your life i, I know it's probably a sensitive one but i know it's something you've also talked about quite a lot um was there was that a wake-up call for you of of, of some form did what did it just confirm something you already knew um or or did you suddenly reevaluate everything at that point yeah it was one of those things where I wasn't surprised. Like I, I knew theoretically that it was a possibility that you know someone who was determined could find my address and send a SWAT team and and basically uh, create a huge annoyance, if not a very life threatening situation for me. But it's one of those you know edge case type of thought exercises where it's really hard to believe that something like that could happen to you. So it was definitely a wake-up call, um, and I certainly don't expect it to ever happen again, especially not after all of the protections that put in place. But it has been a uh, – it's been four years now, actually. I think it was 11 days ago was the four-year anniversary of that happening. And uh, I put out a tweet where I basically said, you know, this is still ongoing. Um, the the case is not closed, um, but I am – I am optimistic that uh, I'll be able to, to share more about it. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's the, um, how does the phrase go? Uh, uh, an ounce of prevention is, is worth uh, a pound of uh, cleanup or solution or whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm boshing that uh, phrase. But the, the point being that, you know, if I had put in the, the time and effort up front, then I wouldn't have had to deal with the countless hours of uh, both, you know, recreating my life with a whole new level of privacy and security and, and paying for all these like, private investigators and um, attorneys and dealing with the criminal justice system, which is just incredibly onerous and uh, I think you know one thing that I can definitely say right now about my whole experience uh, going through the criminal justice system as a victim is that I can't imagine having to go through this process if you were an average person who like didn't have uh, expendable resources to put into it because it, it took years to even get really uh, attention from. Uh, federal investigators, and I basically had to use networking and use money to, to even get to the point where I think anybody would take me seriously, because this this is one of those crimes that almost always goes unpunished. Um, but I am hopeful that the, the criminal justice system seems to be slowly catching up. And I think there was actually an announcement from the Department of Justice recently where they're actually um, focusing on creating a whole new like cyber criminal division. And um, this is something that I think has really been a problem ever since the internet started going mainstream is that the way the justice system was set up, um, historically, you know, pretty much all crimes were local crimes. And so you know, your local jurisdiction, therefore, would be uh, the ones that were tasked with uh, investigating and prosecuting and sentencing and all of that uh, for whoever the criminal was. But now that the crimes can cross jurisdictions so easily, very commonly in uh, criminal cases like this, it gets escalated to the federal level. So essentially, um, you know, the, the, in the United States, the, the federal um, law enforcement 
system is completely overwhelmed. Like they can't possibly uh, keep up with all of this stuff and the states feel like they don't have the jurisdiction. But um, I think that's changing. And uh, unfortunately, you know, I may be a part of, of that change, but um, I think it's something that has to happen. So it sounds like um, the, the message there is just to do everything you can to avoid that, uh, um, which I suppose is why we're on this call, is talking about uh, anonymity, talking about um, security of, of your key critical data. And um, the more you preserve that, the, the less likely, likely you are to have to deal with the, the U.S. federal uh, justice system. So um, exactly. <laughs> from that perspective, what do you see as the biggest priorities um, for the next five years of your work, let's say, um, in the Bitcoin space. And um, maybe after that, we can open up to the audience. And so if you do have a question, um, please start requesting that. Um, by the way, this is being recorded. So if you don't want to be recorded, please don't request. <laughs> anyway, back to you, James. James. Yes. Yeah, so um, like I said, I'm, I'm, I think I'm still just going to be focused on low level private key management. But and the question that it it really comes down to is if you can get to the point that we can make security a, uh, a usable, acquirable uh, state by the average person, then where do we go from there? And CASA has never fundamentally considered itself just a Bitcoin company. We consider ourselves like a self-sovereignty company and that our thesis is that private keys are going to be, pun intended, I guess, the key to uh, an enormous amount of functionality uh, in the future. And it just so happens to be that right now the, the most obvious way to take advantage of the, the power of private keys is with money itself. Um, you know, the, there obviously are plenty of other things that you can do, like with GPG, uh, but you know, the usability around that is uh, horrendous. And um, point being, like I said at the very beginning, there are so many other teams and projects that are building really, really cool stuff on top, you know, multiple layers uh, of this technology that we want to be able to facilitate uh, as much of that as possible. And there's going to be trade-offs. There's going to be different, uh, I guess, gradients of the security and convenience scale. So while I've mostly been focused on the extreme end of super duper high security for you know life changing amounts of value, which means people are going to be willing to put up with a fair amount of inconvenience in order to get that high level of security. We recognize that that's not what all of the functionality in the space is going to be based around. There are going to be things where you're going to want to be uh, signing and transacting and doing more interactive stuff on a day-to-day -day basis. Maybe those are financial transactions. Maybe they are like identity and reputation and social media-based transactions. Um, I don't um, pretend to have like the specific knowledge of exactly how the space is going to go, but I think that you know more and more of our lives is going to be based around private keys. So from from that aspect, the the question becomes, you know, how do we continue to provide better and better user experience um, but do so in a way that people can do more complex and more convoluted stuff and and that's where it gets scary right now. I think we'll, we'll probably talk about a number of these scary things, but um, you know, even even within, I guess, a lot of the like Ethereum, DeFi uh, stuff that's out there right now, there are some scary things that are being exploited. Where you know, even if you have uh, a hardware wallet, it may not be enough to protect you, and and you know, that's. That's where you know, we need to keep making improvements both on the hardware and the software side as, as the whole space becomes more complex. Yeah, I think you're onto something. Um, it, the, the idea of 
um, not considering yourself a Bitcoin company um, ra raises a lot of questions about security um, when you're considering chains that are centralized and therefore they get their security from there, but they, they do have these inherent vulnerabilities um, in their smart contracts and so on. Um, and perhaps when we're talking about um, scams in the space, we, we talk about scams being... Um, people trying to fish you and phishing websites and things like that. But we also talk about the projects themselves um, be, being scams. And I, I feel like there's um, something to be said for um, the, the do your own research uh, uh, tribe and people who, who recommend um, more of a, um, a critical thing, more critical thinking when it comes to what you're doing with your money. And I feel like the, the crypto space is kind of moving away from that. Um, so, do you consider that um, scams in general are um, are in these two camps, or would you say that it's all one problem that we can address at, at the same time? It's really hard, I think, to say that you know all of the, the problems that are leading people to part with their money when they end up regretting it or didn't intend to are scams. Um, so I'm, I'm generally not a fan of the word scam. Like I, I prefer to be more specific about exactly what is happening. And that's because I, scam is just such a, a, an umbrella term that can encompass so many different uh, ways of either, you know, technically, tricking someone or just doing a, some sort of social engineering, which I often refer to as, uh, you know, hacking someone's brain uh, to get them to basically authenticate and bypass all of the technical uh, security mechanisms that, that have been put in place. I mean, there are, of course, uh, projects that are obvious like ICO scams that are, you know, they, they have no intention of ever building the things that they're trying to build. Um, but then on the other hand, there are tokens and networks out there that are really gray area borderline. Um, it's, you know, more like, uh, like Theranos kind of like fake it till you make it. Like we know that they can't do what they claim they may one day be able to do, but who knows? You can't, you know, you can't prove a negative. You can't prove that someone will never be able to, you know, achieve some sort of functionality that they claim that they're building. So that's where it gets a lot, uh, I think, trickier. Um, but then of course there are, there are also, a decent number of people in the space, probably mostly newbies, will fall prey to scams that we all consider to be obvious. You know, the, um, the like crypto doubler scams, the like the fake Elon Musk's and fake celebrities who say that you know if you send them so much Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever, they'll double or triple it. You know, that's obvious, um, but. There's, we, we've also seen just a lot of other social uh, engineering scams that happen as a result of data leaks. And, you know, you might get uh, scareware or blackmail messages. They might, you know, claim to have, like, hacked your computer and have photos or video of you in compromising positions. Uh, I think those are called sextortion scams. Um, there's, uh, there's even... At a, at a technical level, uh, fake airdrops. Um, and, and so, you know, because airdrops are a real thing, there have been people that have created you know, malicious uh, software forks that will say, you know, if you own this much of a token, you just install this software and you'll get the same amount of this new token. But if you install that software, it'll actually steal all your money. Um, it, there's just so many different ways you know we could enumerate through dozens if not hundreds of them but the, the point is you know this is this is a never-ending problem and so while i generally focus on you know, technically securing private key data and and doing that can protect people against certain types of quote-unquote scams at the end of the day 
there is no technical solution to the human problem of you getting simply tricked into authenticating and sending your money somewhere. The one thing that I would say that I do like about multi-signature uh, aspects of storing your wealth, especially if you're, if you're storing the keys far away from each other so that you have to physically travel, and this becomes onerous, of course, um, is that I think that it's less likely that you will fall victim to your human nature of greediness and just clicking on something and sending some money because you thought that it was going to be profitable for you. And maybe that'll give you more time to think about exactly what you're doing before you uh, send your money somewhere. And, and you know, sometimes, sometimes this isn't necessarily even like a, a doubler scam. You know, there have even been uh, services that claim to be like uh, privacy uh, mixing services. And, um, I guess even just going back to some of the original quote-unquote scams, uh, you know, exchange exit scams, there have been plenty of those. And so this is, once again, you know, why self-custody is important, is you never know what somebody might do if they have the keys. Yeah, I think that covers <laughs> the, the many, fa many um, yeah, factors of, of scamming very well. Um, rather than dwelling on this, maybe we can go back to the idea of uh, hacking your brain um, against hacking your device. So I suppose one of those would be considered infosec and the other uh, opsec. So would you maybe um, have any, well, well, could you first maybe describe those two approaches um, to security? And um, do, do you believe that there's some combination in there that would be able to help people avoid these things? Or do you think that it's more about the schema having, having that multi-signature setup that limits what you're able to, what mistakes you're able to make? Do you think that's maybe the only way to go? Yeah, I mean, I, I think they're very similar, uh, though I generally think of InfoSec more in enterprise terms uh, when you know, you're holding on to a lot of data and trying to figure out uh, how to best classify it uh, as you know, different levels of sensitivity and, and thus how to restrict access to it. Whereas I think OFSEC is something that every individual should be thinking about. And it's, it's more around you know, how do I prevent third parties from getting any sensitive data or you know, as, as little data as possible on me um, so that it can't be used against me. Because uh, the, the one, the commonality between all of this is that nowadays with the internet, you know, information wants to be free, information flows at the speed of light. Um, information is hard to secure. Uh, it's the same reason why there are so many businesses that are built around securing private keys. All we're really doing is securing, you know, a few hundred bytes of information. But that information is of some of the utmost importance and utmost sensitivity. When uh, I was working at the, the big data uh, marketing company back in the day, and we were in the early days of cloud computing and storing hundreds of petabytes of raw metrics on our own clusters, we had people try to hack into us or social engineer any of our clients in order to get into their accounts and so on and so forth. And we didn't have private keys, like Bitcoin didn't even exist back then. But what we had was information, which was the next best thing. And even though we told our customers you know, we are not a like HIPAA compliant, you know, highly um, secure database. Like, don't put sensitive information into our APIs and into our database. They did it anyways, and so a number of our customers would put anything from social security numbers to credit card numbers to you know names, addresses, uh, everything that you can imagine, 
And of course, that stuff has value. Uh, back then, it was primarily used for identity theft if you know, criminal organizations got a hand on it. But you know, that's why we had a number of different uh, attempts and a, a few successful intrusions, uh, usually because of problems with uh, the actual you know, clients themselves, not our own infrastructure. But nonetheless, they were still able to get in and siphon off large amounts of data. And so... This uh, that you know that was more of an info sec problem. Though there wasn't a ton that we could do about it, other than try to monitor what the data our customers were putting in uh, to our own databases were, and tell them to stop being idiots. Um, whereas opsec is something that I think about every day. Um, you know, I. I I went out and ran some errands today, and uh, had to go give some contact information to uh, a service so that they could get back to me when they were done. And, you know, I had, because I don't give people my real name, address, phone number, so on and so forth, uh, unless it's absolutely necessary, you know, I had to decide, you know, what pseudonym am I going to give this service? Which of my burner virtual phone numbers am I going to give them? And the reason that I do that, and it is, it's annoying, it's onerous, um, but now I know that I don't have to worry about what that particular service provider's uh, infosec is. You know, I don't, I, I have to assume that they're all idiots and they're going to get hacked or leak, the, leak it or sell it or, you know, do something uh, because that's just the nature of information these days. So, um yeah, like I said, OPSEC is what I think most of the listeners in this audience need to be worrying about. You know, protect your own data, prevent as many entities as possible from having it, because you don't know what uh, the InfoSec practices and policies are of everyone that you're interacting with. That's that's a great answer. I think um, we're we're kind of looking to you uh, for for this uh, as this kind of model of how to do it. Um, would you say there's anything that you could share about, um, say, a minimum viable um, approach to 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 opsec, um, where uh, a newcomer could reevaluate how they're approaching things now um, and decide what they're going to do to secure their their most critical data? How how would they go about doing that? Um, and in the meantime, if anyone wants to request to speak, feel free. Um, we're we're open to any questions. Yeah, I mean, uh, entire books have been written about this, and uh, the short version that I tell people, at least if you're American, you should spend thirty or forty dollars on Amazon and buy the uh, most recent edition, I think it's the third edition now, of Extreme Privacy uh, by Michael Bazell. Um, and you'll see, I think it's like 500 pages now. It seems like each new edition adds another 100 pages. Um, it's because there's so many different aspects of your life um, that you can worry about. And, you know, I'm an extreme example. Uh, I, I don't expect most people are going to use burner phone numbers or set up intricate systems of uh, physical remailers so that they can still receive packages uh, without giving away, you know, what geographic location they're in. But you don't have to start out at the extreme. Um, you can incrementally improve your privacy. You know, you can make it like a weekend hobby project where you just spend an hour or two each weekend looking at your own life and saying, okay, I can make this one slight change. And that's really what it all is. It's um, when it comes to privacy and OPSEC, it is about making changes to your habits. And you need to um, basically reprogram yourself. Um, it, it, after you've been doing it for a few years, it becomes second nature. But, you know, I can tell you from experience that going around and giving a pseudonym, um, especially like in social situations, it, it feels really weird, uh, at least for the first year or so. And then eventually you start to easily start, you know, automatically responding to that pseudonym, um, which, you know, is important if you don't want to be too weird. But once again, 
I don't expect people to go around and not give their real name, uh, at least to, to friends that they're meeting. It, it just depends on what your threat model is. And I, I think a lot of people aren't going to have the same threat model as myself uh, because, you know, I am fairly high profile, at least in this niche space. Uh, I, I do work for a company that is focused on security for a lot of high net worth people. And I'm sure there were people there are people out there who would love to get their hands on me and try to torture me and you know, get sensitive information out of me. Not that it would get them anything because we've you know, set up our own infrastructure in a way so that I'm not a single point of failure. Our own company is not a single point of failure, but you know, somebody would probably be willing to try because they figure uh, the potential reward might be worth it. So that's, I guess, the, the short version is there are things that you can do the, the, the easiest thing that anybody can do is just protect your day-to-day -day, um, web usage. You know, install ad blockers, consider setting up a VPN. They're actually really easy to do these days. Uh, a lot of VPN providers out there will have, you know, executable software that you can run that'll automatically just run in the background uh, whenever your computer starts up. So it, it really is not nearly as difficult as it was you know, 10, 15 years ago. So just by pr protecting like your day-to-day -day email browsing and usage, you know, that'll do a really good job you know, putting you ahead of like 99% of the rest of people, just preventing all of your, your web browsing uh, from being correlated together. And like I said, I was the guy who used to be doing that. So I, I know exactly how much information is being uh, scooped up and analyzed. Okay, yeah, I think that's that's really reassuring to hear from you that a VPN is going to do anything for for your privacy. Um, I, I think a lot of people are are dubious about the the trust and so on that's involved. But um, instead of diving into that, um, I've added Mike as a speaker. So hi, Mike. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, not the best speaker, but uh, I've got something on my mind here. I've been quite surprised that I have not seen it more utilized. I've been in the IT space for many years and. Um, though I'm not the best speaker, I think myself to be quite a guru when it comes to cryptography. That's my compassion. Uh, I just want to put something out there. I'm surprised that I haven't seen it utilized more. What I love about crypto is that, you know, mainly if I was just swiped up and put into a uh, jungle, uh, buck naked, I could come out and have my money. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, I've toyed around with the idea of having you know, how can I secure my seeds with, uh, so I, I use a lot of encryption. Um, I talk about encryption a lot, you know, I mean, there's, you could put your seed words encrypted on a billboard and be safe with, uh, nobody being able to, uh, to know what those were, but, uh, the average bear cannot, uh, remember 12 to 24 words. One of the things I've done, and I, I say that, you know, I'm surprised no one's utilized this is, is taking, uh, you know, a key phrase. Let's use uh, like Satoshi Nakamoto as an example. If you take Satoshi Nakamoto in very, any variation, whether it be capital S's, uh, all capital, you're going to get 128 bits of data in binary. And uh, I believe strongly that uh, when it comes right down to it, is trusting our randomness is, is the issue here. Do we trust it software level, hardware level? Um, so one of the scripts, as an example, uh, Ant Coleman has a, a, a great script out there, you know, utilized offline that would allow you to use binary as your randomness. So if you take a converter and you convert Satoshi Nakamoto, just as an example, you're going to get 128 bits of data, which equals 12 seed words, right? If you're using that as your randomness um, in binary form. So one of the things that I do is I have a phrase in my head that will equate to at least 128 bits. Uh, to make it more complicated, you could kind of back out. If it ends up being more, you could back out and still have that 128 bits uh, or 256 for um, the keywords. So all you really have to remember is one phrase converted to binary, and that is your randomness. And I'm surprised there's not a platform that has not utilized that. 
uh, whether it be to educate people to uh, utilize that system. Because I, the, the key here is we are the weakest link. So if uh, we're yeah. storing 12 or 24 words on a, on a document um, or, you know, on the cloud and we got some rogue Dropbox administrator, um, you know, searching for keywords to get those. So that, that's, that's a big deal right there. Um, well, I can tell you why. I can okay. give you several reasons why that's not a common thing. And so uh, what, what you're essentially describing is a brain wallet. And there are a few, well, you know, we're just talking about data and entropy. So, you know, you can come up with your own scheme, but there, there are a few schemes out there for brain wallets that have been developed over the years. Uh, the first thing that I would suggest you go check out is search for a piece of software called Brain Flare. Uh, there's an entire uh, talk, actually, that was given a number of years ago by the author of Brain Flare. And basically what they showed is that they can do what is essentially a dictionary attack and very easily sweep up funds from brain wallets that are using you know, human-generated phrases. You know, a lot of people tend to use popular phrases that can be found in literature or pop culture or whatever. And he basically found that he could you know, create a dictionary attack and, and run these servers 24-7 uh, that are just listening to deposits on the network and listening for deposits to billions of different addresses that he's already pre-generated and found the private keys for, you know, all these different permutations. And he managed to steal hundreds, if not thousands, of Bitcoin. Uh, thankfully, he was a white hat hacker, and, you know, he, he gave as much of it back as he was able to find the owners to. But the, the reason that this is a problem and I think you touched on it, is that humans are not good sources of entropy. And, you know, you, you said, you know, how can we find really any good random number generator that we can trust? And uh, probably I would say the best solution to that would be diceware. Um, you know, if you get some, like, casino-grade dice that are, you know, uh, fair to roll. There, there are ways for you to, you know, roll them like a hundred times and and generate really, really good entropy that you can then use to generate your own keys if you don't want to trust these hardware devices uh, to generate them themselves. Um, that's just the technical reason why it's not great. The next reason is actually a long-term issue. I think the the idea that brain wallets can be used to like portably and you know concealably transport private keys across the world that's a great great use case if you're like a refugee or something. I would not put money in them for more than like a few days and that's only if it was really really good uh, random entropy um, you know I would only do that for a short trip if I was like in a dire situation needing to escape from some terrible situation but um, uh, back to the, the, the bigger point is that um, there, whenever you create any sort of setup for securing private keys, you also need to think about inheritance. You know, what happens if you get hit by a truck? Because you know, we as humans are fragile single points of failure. And uh, if, uh, if you're in the situation where you have any sort of heirs or beneficiaries and, and you don't want your money to end up just being permanently lost, then you do need to have some way for the people that you care about to be able to recover those funds. And that gets into a really weird, tricky security situation of like, how do you do that in a way that then isn't giving complete custody to these people right now so that they could steal your funds from you? And it, we spent basically a whole year at CASA thinking through inheritance problems. Um, there's also some good inheritance uh, guides out there. I, I would recommend buying Pamela Morgan's uh, Crypto Asset Inheritance Guide. Uh, I learned a lot from reading that. Uh, inheritance is its own complicated issue. Um, and, and it's less because of technical factors and just because of human factors. Very good. Thanks for letting me speak, guys. Hey guys, thanks for letting me up. I have a I have a quick uh, question, and I'm sorry if this has already come up. Um, I just joined the space a little late. Um, my question is like for um, some some good measures uh, for like a digital nomad, where you know necessary like keeping seed phrase in a safe in a home location uh, really doesn't make sense, you know, because um, you know a digital nomad may not have access to that property and also might not feel secure um, leaving their seed there while, um, you know, they're elsewhere moving around the world. So 
Yeah, I was just I have, I have a few perco- or a few methods I use myself, but I would love to just get um yeah your take lop if you, if you've got some some good ideas there. Yeah, this is a, a challenge, and I I mean I move around a fair about myself, but I'm not really like a full time digital nomad. Um, There, I think once again, it, it comes down to you know, what do you need to be able to access immediately? What do you need to be able to access with a short or medium amount of delay? And what are you uh, willing to, to sock away long term that's like really, really hard to access? Because at least for the former, which like I said, is really what, or or for the latter, which is what I've mostly focused on that. Like if you have the majority of your net worth, uh, it's being secured by private keys. Um, I make some assumptions here, which is that, you know, you're probably not trading it. You know, you're probably not selling it or or moving it like more than once every few months. If then you may only move it once every few years. Um, and for, for that level of security, even a digital nomad, I would expect, has some sort of semi-trusted friends and family. And that's a, a good way to essentially create some sort of either multi-sig or like a Shamir secret sharing, you know, sharded backup solution where... Uh, you're giving pieces of data to a group of people that you don't necessarily fully trust, but you somewhat trust, and they, they're not taking custody of it. They don't even have the ability to access it. But this is um, really what I did a number of years ago before I was really even using multisig. Um, and I, I have a, a blog post about it, um, but the the short version is I, I would use um, some encryption software. I guess I was using TrueCrypt back then, but now you would want to use VeraCrypt um, because that's sort of the the successor to TrueCrypt. And I would I would take all of my backup information, all of my sensitive data, and I would create a fully encrypted data partition with that. And I would take, I would generate, you know, using like a password manager or something, some sort of source of entropy, I would generate an extremely long random set of characters as the encryption phrase. So something so long that even I didn't know what it was. And then I would use a Shamir secret sharing tool to split up that decryption phrase. And I would give copies of the encrypted volume to you know, this handful of different um, people, friends, and family. And I would give them one piece of the decryption phrase, along with, of course, the actual Shamir secret sharing software and instructions for how to use it and stuff. And you know, it's, it's onerous to do. Um, and you certainly need to make sure that you, you test the, the whole setup and make sure that the people who have that know how to use it. And that's sort of your like uh, emergency, you know, everything went wrong type of backup, you know, the final fail safe in case whatever data or hardware devices or whatever that you keep on you uh, get completely lost or destroyed. Um, otherwise, you know, for just sort of the, the more short term, faster to access stuff, then, you know, at least using a, a hardware device to keep that uh, private key offline is good. If you then want to have to deal with things like uh, you know, the physical security of it, then uh, I think Trezor would tell you that you, you should be using the uh, additional uh, 25th word passphrase so that no attacker uh, can get their hands uh, on the keys and, um, you know, whatever you're doing here, you know, you should also have backed up preferably on that like final backstop solution. But 
without going off, you know, into tangents of all of the other permutations, like it, it really depends, right? It, it depends on how, how much you're moving around, what the jurisdictions you're in are like, you know, what your, your threat level is. Um, so it, I don't know how helpful all of this is because it has to be really high level and vague. Uh, there are so many variables at play that you know you have to take into consideration exactly what you're doing. And I don't expect you to you know dox yourself in, in your personal situation here in public. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. That that was uh, very helpful. I've been I've been honestly considering the multi sig approach, which I think is is pretty clever. Um, and just you know. Um, yeah, instilling a few people that I trust very well with um, with uh, different different keys to um, yeah to hold. Um, but yeah, I like that idea of of maybe sectioning off the majority of my stack with um, that mo most secure method of, of multi sig with with very trusted um, uh, friends and family. Um, yeah, and then my my current I think yeah, and then my my current setup too has been like I. Basically, and I'm curious, like how at risk you think this setup would be, but like with an air gap computer, I I, um, I encrypted my keys um, and then have been hosting that encryption through another, well, through Keybase, which has a different set of keys. So as like a as a like a um, as a file server, so I have access to it at all times. However, in order to um, yeah get access to uh, my keys, you need, you have to have like Keybase installed and then I'd have to have, you know, the other, um, uh, keys in order to decrypt to actually, actually get my, my stack, if that makes sense. Um, it's a little early for me. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Like a, a fully encrypted backup that's also on the cloud. Uh, this is, <laughs> so if you really, really know what you're doing, you know, in general, I say like when people are, if people are using air gapped computers, like you'd better be an amazing expert who really, really knows what you're doing because it's, it's almost impossible to really be sure that your computer is air gapped. But once again, like all of these things, it comes down to exactly what your threat level is. What are you trying to protect yourself against? So, you know, theoretically, if you've done everything correct, if you have an amazing, uh, complex, uh, encryption, um, passphrase on that that file volume you're you're uploading you know through keybase or really any cloud service then it's probably fine uh you're certainly orders of magnitude better than uh the people who just take their seed phrase and put it in evernote um but um you know anything that you're putting on the internet uh i think you should assume that that you know the service itself may have a, an employee that decides to, you know, trawl through all the files and, and, you know, puts them on a, a cluster, uh, that they, they're, they're trying to, you know, crack with a, a bunch of GPUs or something. So it's, um, it's, it's hard to say that it's 100% foolproof, um, but it's probably okay. Uh, it's just not something that I would recommend to anyone who you know isn't really, really deep into this stuff. And you know, so, without knowing you and all your skill set, uh, I wouldn't comment one way or another. Um, one thing, kind of going back to the multi-sig or distributed key setup, is that um, you know if you have a huge amount of money that you very rarely need access to, or, or really even, um, you know, we have some clients who ask us, you know, how do I set up nation state level um, robustness? You know, the only way to really get that level of robustness is to not have a spending threshold of keys in one jurisdiction, you know, if you if you go under the assumption that uh, you or whoever is holding a key in any given jurisdiction may find themselves put in a cage and otherwise tortured or coerced into using that key or or whatever keys they have access to, then you know the only foolproof way to be secure against that is to not have the keys there. If we we have to assume that the humans are single points of failure. Uh, 
then it is helpful if you happen to have you know, friends and family who are scattered across different jurisdictions who could essentially act as key holders um, because they don't even have to know about each other. You, know, you can be managing and coordinating a multi-sig setup and when and if you need a signature, you, know, you can send that request to each of those different key holders separately. They don't have to communicate with each other. They only have to communicate with you. They don't even necessarily have to know each other exists uh, for the, the signing interaction. And, and you know, this is one somewhat convenient way of being able to, to transact. But of course, once again, there's a lot of variables here. You, you have to think about you know, what could go wrong? Is it possible that you could lose contact with or, or you know, uh, lose uh, a sufficient number of those key holders uh, if they're not cooperating with you and, and you might get locked out of your funds until you can then go to whatever your super secure uh, ultimate backup solution is to, you know, retrieve enough key material to reconstitute the wallet on your own. But just a few thoughts. Yeah, this is this is awesome. So, um, I, I just I just like to jump in with an observation um, that our last two speakers have both um, come up with, let's say, um, a customized um, security schema of their own, and I, I was just wondering, perhaps we should be pointing out the the, the purpose of standardization as a way of um, actually in ensuring that your security setup is. Going to going to last yeah. until into the future. Yeah. So uh, this is this is just something that is extremely common that we see uh, with people who are talking to us. Um, we call it the treasure hunt uh, solution, where essentially you know people create their own treasure maps, and um, you know that works. Usually, it works pretty well from a security standpoint, but you know the problem with security, at least in this space is uh, it's far too easy to achieve 100% security, which means that no one, including yourself, uh, is able to access those keys. So, you know, we're walking this really fine line here where we want to still be able to access the keys in the right circumstances, uh, but we, uh, we don't want, you know, the wrong people to be able to access them. Great. Um, and we have another speaker here, uh, Karabot. If you have a question, please feel free. Okay, perhaps not going to happen. Um, maybe then we can continue with some other questions um, just about uh, perhaps the idea that... Um, <laughs> that securing the Bitcoin is very, very um, uncertain, and the the general public do, kind of need to rethink um, how security works. So, how how do we approach um, the masses with the, the question of security for Bitcoin? Well, uh, this is. Also, it's just one of our, our theses is that uh, users don't read the manual. And so we, you know, we can write all of the documentation and all of the best practices. And I, I certainly have you know, written countless articles and uh, it's like support knowledge base um, questions. But uh, people are lazy. Uh, you know, people want to take the path of least resistance to achieve their goals. So what we need to do is we need to you know, build the hardware and software that provides as low friction of an experience as possible while guiding the users down the path of following best practices. Like, Following the best practices should not even be a question. It should just be you know, presented as, you know, this is the way that you are going to do it. Um, that, that can be, especially in Bitcoin, a aggravating thing for power users. Um, Casa specifically designs its software uh, not to facilitate a number of different pieces of functionality of things that you can do with Bitcoin. 
And this is a conscious design decision on our part because in, in many cases we think it's more dangerous to let the, uh, the novice users have access to these foot guns uh, then it is worth the benefit of letting the power users access a certain functionality. So, um, you know, uh, one example around that, uh, which I've actually given an entire talks around, is that you've probably heard that you know, Bitcoin supports um, time locking functionality. And time locking functionality does get used in other, uh, you know, like second layer protocols. Uh, I think some of the coin join stuff may use it. Uh, Lightning Network definitely uses it. Um, but I'm not aware of any wallets that just give you a, a like a single field and say, hey, how long do you want to lock your coins for? And there's a number of reasons for this. Uh, one is that I think it would be really easy for someone to you know, shoot themselves in the foot and lock their coins uh, until after they're dead, uh, which, of course, once again, is achieving 100% security. Um, another is that it creates actually a lot of complexity around backups. Uh, it, it actually breaks the ability to have uh, deterministic backups. But there's a lot of things like this that you can do in Bitcoin. You know, Bitcoin is a protocol. Bitcoin has a programming language. Uh, you can create complicated or somewhat you know, relatively complicated, uh, you can call them smart contracts. You know, you're spending conditions, essentially. Uh, uh, you're, you're building these redeemed scripts that describe how the, the coins are able to be spent. Um, and like once you get down to that level, there's a ton of ways that you can screw up and you know accidentally lock yourself out of your own coins. Um, a number of these examples happened you know, er in the early days of Bitcoin. I think even Mt. Gox uh, screwed up and like locked themselves out of like 10,000 coins for all time. And thankfully, I, as far as I'm aware, that seems to be happening less often these days because I think people are. Um, uh, the developers who are building wallets are more often you know, using standardized libraries, like they're not actually building the Bitcoin script, you know, one, one function call at a time. They're using other standard libraries to do that, and that, once again, it helps provide safety rails uh, from shooting yourself in the foot. And, and that's the same type of thing that we need to, to keep happening at higher levels up in the uh, application stack. Yeah, that's a great answer. Um, I think maybe based on that, what would you tell the listeners here today? Um, well, I, I know I, for one, get asked all the time, oh, how do I get into Bitcoin? And then what do I do with it? Um, and I'm going to tell people, send people to an exchange or to an ATM or something. But um, what kind of advice can you give to someone like that to get them to safely start uh, using Bitcoin and know that they're securing it properly and know that they're go not going to go down some dark alley um, <laughs> on the on the internet and lo lose all their coins. Um, what's that, that first elevator question or elevator pitch that you can make? Yeah, um, well, start small, ease into it. You know, much like with the privacy stuff that we were talking about early on, like you don't have to jump in head first. You know, you, you don't have to put your life savings into Bitcoin and, and then, you know, potentially make one catastrophic mistake and lose it all. You know, buy $20 worth, buy $100 worth, play around with it, uh, try out different uh, software, uh, buy different hardware devices, you know, see which ones uh, work best for you. And, um, you know, there's, there's, like I said, there's so many different ways to do self-custody. There's dozens, if not hundreds, of different wallets out there that can help facilitate um, and they have different levels of usability and security. And, you know, for a novice, the, they probably don't really have any way of differentiating, you know, what the actual security is. So, you know, the best way, if, if you get to the point where you have, you know, more than probably a thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin, you should really be looking at, you know, making an investment of five to ten percent of that uh, in a hardware device, uh, get those private keys off the internet. Uh, that gives you additional uh, layers of protection. You know, when you're actually spending it, because you can verify 
the um, details of those transactions on this independent hardware and firmware, so you don't you you don't have to worry about uh, things like uh, your actual wallet software being compromised, for example. And it can be overwhelming. Uh, this is something that I've spent really 10 years immersed in, and I can you know rattle off tens or, or hundreds of different uh, potential vulnerabilities and ways that you know you can lose your money. Uh, but that's only because I've been around for so long and I've seen so many things happen. And you know we shouldn't we shouldn't expect that users are going to know all of that, everything that can go wrong, all of the, the history. Um, I think it's really just a matter of being uh, conservative and being careful, you know, when you're when you're actually sending Bitcoin, when you're sending a, a, a cryptographic bearer asset, it just requires that you change your mindset. It's not like going to the store and buying something with a credit card. It's like paying for something with you know cash or, or a bar of gold. You're, you're not going to be able to get it back if that other person doesn't want to give it to you. So... I think that this actually this goes beyond just like the individual and is actually sort of a cultural uh, paradigm shift that needs to happen, but I don't expect that it will happen quickly. This, this may be a multi-generational shift um, where over time as adoption of these protocols continues to increase, and as people become more comfortable with using them, they also change their mindset in, you know, when they're spending money, exactly uh, you know, what they're thinking about, how careful they're being. And um, I suppose some, some people might say you know, it's, it's kind of a difference between a fiat mindset and a, and a Bitcoin mindset. I think there's a lot of things that have changed and will change uh, just in how we operate our day-to-day -day lives because of this technology. It's, you know, it's all just ripple effects uh, from the, the attributes of the technology and, and how it changes how we interact with other people, how we interact with, uh, with the world, really, from an economic standpoint. Yeah, exciting stuff. <laughs> um, we have another speaker here, Arcplate, um, cold storage solution. Feel free to speak, please. Hey, everyone. My name's uh, David Cowan. I'm the CEO of Arcplate, and I manufacture and design uh, cold wallet solutions. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that has been touched on, there probably a dozen different things that have been discussed over the past 20 minutes that I would love to speak about them all. But um, you know, I'll, I'll touch on a few of them. And I've been trying to solve this solution starting out in digital assets myself and trying to self-custody, um, you know, not only for myself, but my family members who don't understand digital assets and how they work and, and being able to be trusted with their own wallet safety. Um, so I got into this solely from a family perspective of seeing that self-custody of digital assets is probably the the biggest problem in this industry that is not discussed enough um, so trying to manufacture these things and deal with several of these issues that were touched on like being able to give your digital assets as inheritance and finding affordable solutions for each person that they can understand and i see a lot of bottlenecks in the industry and i'd like to get uh, your opinion on on some of these bottlenecks uh, the first one being is a a universally recognized security standard uh, you know much like the bip 39 word list or the shamir word list we have 12, 24, 25 word wallets. Some wallet uses numbers. We're all over the place when it comes to A, having some form of industry recognized, standardized format that everyone can agree upon. And um, thoughts on how we might develop a universal standard so that there's no misunderstanding when it comes to inheritance time, what the format is, how to get those assets, that type of thing. Um, second is, is storage when it comes to physicality and crypto. Um, and that's really what I'm into is trying to take a digital world and have something tangible that you can hold, that you can pass along, that's not stored in the cloud. Um, and so 
trying to come up with solutions, not just for us, because realistically, we are the 1% of the population, the early adopters who who understand this technology to, to some extent. And unfortunately, the reason we're here is that a lot of people still, even in what could be considered the the, the first wave of adopters, still don't understand it. And how are we going to reach mass adoption when it comes to custody of private keys, whether we're going to have pre-issued keys that are given away at a bank, just like a plastic debit card is today. Um, so I'd like to, again, kind of hear your thoughts on what your beliefs are for the future of issuance of whatever keys in institutions, as well as their custody, whether a user may retain custody themselves, whether the institution is going to retain custody. Um, so just a few things and I'll pass it back over here. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I don't know if you are familiar with the XKCD comic about standards, but I think that's basically my, my retort to how do we get to a common standard. Um, standards, uh, you know, it's sort of an, an organic process. And yeah, especially if you go to uh, walletsrecovery.org, I believe, then you'll see what a real mess uh, the quote-unquote standards are just even amongst the wallets in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Um, my only hope there is that over time, and time probably means decades, uh, we eventually coalesce onto similar standards. But you know, when you, you go look through the BIPs, if I recall correctly, like BIPs 39 as a standard is actually discouraged. Uh, for some reason, I, I forget exactly why, and yet almost all of us are using it because I think it's certainly uh, better to have uh, hierarchical deterministic wallets than not. Uh, though you know there are wallets like Electrum that have uh, a different seed phrase standard that that they say is better. Um, I think because it has like a birthday or something encoded into it, uh, or maybe they like the word less better. Who knows? But um. Yeah, it, this is a voluntary system, right? Everybody can create their own standard, and uh, presumably if it's a free market, then the best one should bubble to the top, but who knows how long that will take. Um, as for you know, securing or issuance of keys, uh, I mean, at least the way things have been going, I suspect that a lot of providers... You know, a lot of people are, are, I think it's an onboarding problem. So people are getting onboarded with custodial providers. They are today probably 99% of the on-ramp and off-ramps in the, the system between traditional finance and, and the crypto world are these centralized custodians. And so inevitably what happens is, newbies who have never used any sort of bearer asset before and can't even comprehend of what self-custody means. They're just used to going into a website and, you know, trading, buying stuff. And, and that's, you know, that's like their interface to their bank account and their, their stock market account and so on and so forth. And so they figure, okay, these numbers on this screen on this website say that I own this and that's all there is to it. And so they probably never even bother to try to uh, withdraw because that's just not a functionality that they're used to having. So uh, I think at least for the foreseeable future, that's going to be a really common thing. You know, that it really requires someone to take the initiative to learn that self custody is even an option. Um, you know, there are some companies out there. Uh, that are kind of straddling the line. You know, I, I'm, I'm optimistic that places like uh, Fidelity and Square, uh, for example, will um, help educate users about self-custody as an option. But I think in general, these companies are disincentivized from doing so. And, and one of the main reasons for that is that, you know, the, the financialization of these assets where they're then offering other products, um, you know, based on you know, holding custody of them and rehypothecating them and so on and so forth. So I'm doing my part. I think that's all I can, I can really do is, you know, uh, those of us who, who care about the 
overall security and distribution of the system need to keep making it easier, need to keep explaining to people why self-custody is something that they should care about. And, you know, obviously there's, there's the personal incentives, which is that, you know, the entire point of these systems is to not have to trust third parties because of all the ways that they can screw with you. And then at an even higher, like, meta level, it's that if we don't have a sufficient distribution and um, level of self-custody, then all we're really doing is you're recreating a new centralized financial system where all the same tricks are going to be used against us by a small group of elites. Uh, and, you know, worst case scenario, they are then able to have enough power, enough uh, you know, control over enough value of the system that they might be able to change attributes of the system itself. Oh, definitely. That's, that's, again, there's a huge amount of information when it comes to this. And again, my focus from the start of this has been to offer people, a, you know, just an alternative way um, to be able to self custody. And again, inheritance was a big thing with that. And, um, you know, it's, it's curious to think about what the future holds when it comes to key storage, as well as, as inheritance. And, you know, when it comes to how I've set things up personally with my family. Uh, again, I manufacture cold wallets, so I've got my own special models that I have for myself and my family, and they're buried in a known location, and that particular location is given to certain family members. And again, I will have theirs, they will have mine, and we know each other's locations. And of course, that brings in you know multi-sig or things like Samir, where we have the ability to split up into shards and to be able to have the conceptual of model of having cold wallets as a, as a primary way of storing digital assets using something like Trezor hardware wallets to actually interface and to have, you know, a possession of one, one of the shards is with you. One of the shards is with your lawyer who has your will. And one shard is with a family member so that at any given point in time, you will have access to another shard or again, in the event of a passing some way of passing along the custody of those assets to the, the next person in line for their possession. Um, so what are your thoughts on, on inheritance and passing it along to, to the next line? Yeah, uh, that's actually very similar to the solution we ended up landing on at Casa, which is like, we didn't want to recreate the wheel. We wanted to have an inheritance setup that followed, you know, established guidelines for how inheritance already works, which is, you know, you have an executor, you have beneficiaries. Um, in many cases, you have a variety of different financial accounts that have beneficiaries listed on them, and you know there are established ways. You know, if you have like a brokerage account, for example, you have beneficiaries on it, there are established ways for those beneficiaries to essentially uh, prove to the brokerage that you have died, that you know, they are the beneficiary, they are who they claim they are, they should be able to take uh, control of those accounts. And you know, we basically did something similar, except that you know, we're, we're wrapping it all around private keys. And so... Uh, you know, for a, a, a private key-based inheritance solution, you want everybody who's involved to, to know about it. Um, you want to have your estate attorney well-informed, and uh, they may be a key holder uh, in a multi-sig. Uh, they should certainly have like the instructions of how it's set up and, and how to uh, recover those funds. And then you may decide, um, you know, depending upon the, the games theory and how you trust people, you, you may have a beneficiary or two hold a key or two, or you may have completely uh, neutral third parties act as executors who then are key holders and can help manage uh, the distribution of the assets. But this is why inheritance in particular is a really gnarly problem, because it, 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 it becomes increasingly complex based upon your own family and your attributes and, you know, potential personal and social issues and whatnot. 
Awesome. Well, I appreciate your responses. I'll let uh, another speaker go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, we have here Chad. I don't know if you can hear us, Chad, but you're up next. Um, and just in regards to that, I feel like inheritance is one of these really tricky things um, when it comes to Bitcoin because there are many ways to approach it and none of them are standardized. So I think a uh, really good job for raising that um, from, from <laughs> ArcPlate. Um, so Chad is not joining. I was just wondering if we could think a bit about the... Um, what's acceptable as a security technology? And I was just wondering, James, what your, thought, Jameson, uh, what your thoughts are on um, biometric security in, um, in crypto. Is it completely a void? Is there a place for it? Um, there's been that world coin. I didn't want to mention the name, but it's, <laughs> everyone knows about it. Um, where it's harvesting biometric data. Um, and do you have any concerns about that? Absolutely. Um, so I think my biggest problem and really any uh, security professional's biggest problem with biometric authentication is when it's used as a single point of authentication. Um, I guess one of the sort of catchphrases that has become a thing is that uh, biometrics should be considered usernames and not passwords. And there's some good reasons for that, um, mainly you know, for, for good password hygiene and good password management, you should be able to change your password if you ever think it's compromised. Whereas, uh, good luck changing your biometrics if they get leaked and compromised. So I think that there is a place for biometrics uh, as you know, one of a multi-factor authentication solution. Uh, perhaps you, you know, use it as like the initial login of like, this is your username. And then to get to the next step, you have to provide uh, some sort of password or, or other signature. Um, you know, from a security perspective with authentication, there's, there's really three major types of authentication. So there's something you know, which is like a password, you know, some random string, some random alphanumeric characters or whatever. There's something you have, and that would be something like uh, a YubiKey, uh, you know, piece of hardware. You know, you, Trezor uh, actually, I believe, I believe Trezor can do U2F uh, uh, authentication, for example. Um, yeah. And then uh, <laughs> finally, there is something you are, and that's the the biometrics. And really, if we're talking about high security, then you never want there to be only a single piece of authentication. Uh, you want there to be multiple factors of authentication because you should operate under the assumption that any one thing is going to become compromised. So, um, you know, I, I haven't dug too much into like WorldCoin itself, for example. I know that they, they seem to be using the biometrics as an um, anti sybil uh, type of mechanism. Um, I, I'm not aware that they're using them on a like regular basis, like as authentication to your wallet or transacting. I could be wrong. I haven't really looked into it, but obviously even just the fact that they're collecting, uh, biometrics in the first place is scary. There's just so many things that could go wrong there. So, um, I personally do not use biometrics for anything. Um, if I if I did, and what probably the most common form of what people are using is, you're probably using biometrics to unlock your phone. It's just so convenient, right, to, to have uh, either your, your face unlock or your fingerprint unlock uh, on your phone. And I don't do that. I have a really long pin, and I probably have to put that pin into my phone dozens of times a day. Uh, I don't really want to think about you know, how much time uh, that ends up costing me. But the reason that I do that is that I assume that if someone is holding me under duress, then they're going to be able to unlock my phone with my biometrics, and I don't want that to be a possibility. So uh, there's actually – it's and it's not just that I'm, like, I'm saying I'm a badass because no one could torture me or anything. There's actually legal precedent, at least in the United States, where, uh, you know, 
my big problem or my, I guess one of my bigger fears is just uh, border crossings. So, you know, whenever I cross a border, I power everything down, make, so all of my data is encrypted at rest. And that means that if I got detained for some reason, uh, they're not going to be able to just power off my device and then, you know, push my finger on the phone or put it up to my face and be able to unlock it. Uh, because there are, there have been court cases that have basically shown that the Fourth Amendment uh, protections do not cover biometric unlocking, but they do cover uh, password and PIN-based uh, unlocking. So you can not be coerced into handing over a PIN or a password to your devices, at least in the United States, but you can be coerced into handing over your biometrics. Yeah, um, on that point, um, there was recently a post by Jonas Schnelli, um, Bitcoin Core developer, and uh, his parting words were that um, future developers should join anonymously. Um, and then he says it's, it's tricky to do so. Um, I suppose you're kind of existing in a similar vein as, as those core devs where um, the, there's always motivation for someone to harm you, say, let's say, or put you under duress and try and get, get your secrets out. So um, would you maybe speak to anonymity in Bitcoin as, as something that should go together? Yeah, you know, I've actually uh, fantasized about a world in which uh, every uh, pull request and every commit to you know, Bitcoin repositories is uh, done by, uh, you know, anonymous, randomized hash GitHub username, basically. Um, or, you know, preferably even a more on a more decentralized system than GitHub, but that's a whole other issue. Um, <clears throat> and I have a, a really long post that I, I wrote a while ago uh, entitled, like, Who Controls Bitcoin Core? Because there's a lot of FUD around that, uh, because there are like half a dozen people who have uh, merge access to the repository. And uh, sometimes people try to, you know, do game theory out, well, well you know, could one of them be compromised and then the whole project gets compromised, so on and so forth. And it would certainly be better if, you know, all the, the maintainers of these important software repositories uh, were not known identities so that they couldn't be targeted. Um, but the, the, the problem I kept running into when I tried to sort of game that out is that uh, at least amongst... Um, people who are committing code to open source projects. I mean, reputation is a thing. And if everyone was completely anonymous, like where I was thinking of like a, a system where even if you, you wouldn't even have a username, you know, it would be kind of like 4chan where like every time you post, it's, it's a different randomized username. That system, I, I'm, I'm skeptical that could ever work uh, because um, if there's if there's no reputation, uh, it's kind of demotivating, and and also uh, reputation does help people create shelling points, and shelling points are kind of important in open source projects. Um, but as for like individual users, it's um, I mean privacy, operational security uh, is important because you know, we've changed the model. Uh, the incentives are a lot higher for attackers because these are bearer assets. Um, I'm, I'm not going to say, however, that you know, many people will achieve true anonymity. It's a really, really high bar. It's, it's quite impressive that Satoshi has managed to remain anonymous. So that is... I suppose Satoshi is a great optimistic example of the fact that it can be done, but I think we should also assume that Satoshi really, really knew what they were doing. They seemed to cover their tracks pretty well. Uh, and the, the problem with privacy, especially if you're trying to achieve perfect anonymity, is that uh, you only have to make one mistake. You know, you have to re retain perfect operational security at all times. Whereas an attacker who's trying to pierce through the, the shields of privacy that you've erected, they only have to succeed one time. So it's very imbalanced uh, from that perspective. 
and that's why it's very very hard to achieve perfection but i don't think that that's what people should be trying for um really anything is better than nothing <laughs> yeah i think that's a very fair um <laughs> fair direction to go is just try and secure your your bitcoin as, as good as possible and use the tools that are available there for you um we we have another speaker here to ask some questions and if anyone else from the audience wants to ask um jameson how long do you have um maybe we have another 10 minutes for questions sounds good perfect so uh, request to speak and um sorosh if you would like to speak please go ahead Ah uh, yes uh, my name's Sir Shirali. i'm a undergraduate student at the university of arkansas computer science and um with self-custody i was wondering um what is the best, or not the best, but your personal favorite, uh, I didn't catch it, Jameson, for yourself, if uh, you don't mind me asking? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm highly biased because I've spent the past three years uh, building my, my company, Casa, to, to do that. Um, I, I don't know, I probably didn't really touch on it um, earlier, but like I said, I spent the first three years of my full-time Bitcoin work building security in the enterprise setting. And even after doing that for three years and generally being considered one of the top Bitcoin security experts, I found my own cold storage set up to be really onerous. And I did touch on that earlier where I was talking about you know, creating these like Veracrypt encrypted file containers and Shamir secret sharing the decryption phrase. And um, I would basically do that on an annual basis and update everything and then have to, you know, go distribute the, um, the data drives and keys to my executors. And it was onerous. It would take me like a whole weekend to, to set it up and to test it, you know, and you know, do this all on an air gapped machine, at least the machine that I thought was air gapped. You know, like I said, you can't perfectly prove that, but, um, I figured, you know, if it takes me a whole weekend to do this and I'm highly motivated to do this because, uh, the you know, majority of my net worth is in these private keys then how can I possibly assume that you know, more average mainstream people who aren't so incentivized, who aren't so technical, who aren't living, eating, and breathing this stuff every day for a decade are going to do what I consider to be the best practices for all of this? And so that's why it was natural uh, for me to do the slight pivot and try to – take the best practices, take the multi-sig aspects of the protocol and build something that was more user-friendly. So, so I guess that's the, the long-winded way of saying that, you know, um, CASA, you know, distributed multi-sig, um, you know, you, you don't have to use CASA. You know, we just try to make it easier. Uh, we're not doing anything completely novel and reinventing the wheel. Uh, we're using standards uh, we're, we're building on top of well-established hardware and software in the space. We're just trying to make it easier for people to create a, uh, a multi-signature setup where the keys are geographically distributed and you're storing those keys on a variety of different manufacturer uh, hardware. And the whole point of all of this is, is very simple and that is to eliminate single points of failure. So we, we look at like every piece of the system and how it's architected and say, okay, well, if this thing blows up, will it be catastrophic? And if so, then we need to you know, add more redundancy there. So uh, that's, I guess, the, the short version um, is not, not just one key. Uh, even... Even if you have you know one set of keys and you create multiple backups of them, then you, you start running into this rabbit hole of you know how do you ensure all the backups are also secure against things like physical attackers. Um, I think most people would say, well, you have to encrypt the backups or you have to have some sort of other you know password or whatever to, to be able to access those. And so then the question is, okay, how do you back up the the password or the encryption key to that? And 
it can very easily turn into a more convoluted rabbit hole uh, to, to you know, keep the whole system together. So uh, I felt like just worrying about the keys themselves and putting those keys on physical devices that people can easily you know, think of and visualize and keep track of, that that was a more like, straightforward way for people to, to do private key management. Perfect. I appreciate it. And then uh, last thing is Casa uh, Hodl, the physical device, y'all sell it as well, or was there a recommendation for physical key and storage unit? Yeah, so we very, we very specifically do not manufacture our own hardware devices because we don't want uh, too much trust to be in Casa itself. You know, we write the software but we use um, and we support a variety of different hardware devices. Uh, Trezor was the first device we supported. Uh, they are the, really the OG of uh, hardware key management. Uh, then we added Ledger, and then we added Cold Card, and most recently we added um, Keystone. And we're going to keep adding uh, devices that we believe will continue to improve the usability and the security of the, the whole uh, suite of software that we are offering to people. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, if there's anyone else who wants to speak, we still have another five minutes, so please do request. Otherwise, we'll be wrapping up soon. Um, Jameson, thanks a lot for your time. I think this has been really um, enlightening in in many ways so um i guess the key takeaways here are um do what you can uh to secure your your coins um don't think that anything is too little um but continuously uh, strive for more um think about your multiple um well, the attack vectors that you have within your life and maybe um, personalize it to yourself um and yeah, I suppose we, we all just need to be a bit more aware of the of this huge transitionary um, period. So where people are not so familiar with, with with Bitcoin yet and are not used to the new levels of security, we need to start um, really hammering down those uh, those veins in 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 our society. So uh, Raymond, Raymond's just joined us. Um, Welcome to our talk. <laughs> I've seen you here for a while. Please uh, go ahead and speak. I just wanted to ask a quick question as um, Taproot approaches. Uh, obviously, you know, Taproot gets activated next month, and you're probably held up by um, you know support from all the hardware manufacturers. Um, will you be adding Taproot support to Casa as soon as it's ready per? quorum setup like let's say if i have like you know two trezors or trezor and a ledger as long as i've got those two could we do taproot support or do you have to work wait for all four of the hardware manufacturers plus your internal um, services before taproot set casa yeah this is going to be uh an interesting uh thing to deal with um in particular, you know, the, the fact that we support a variety of different manufacturers' hardware devices and they may not all support the same thing at the same time, that can definitely be a gating function. Um, but with, with Taproot, it's even trickier because I do not expect that we're just going to go in and implement uh, Taproot where we're doing multi-sig via, um, you know, creating the actual like multi-sig spending pass where it, it still gets all exposed on chain. Like, I don't think we're as interested in doing that as we are in waiting for there to be a clear winner when it comes to uh, signature aggregation. And, and right now it seems like there's maybe three different proposals for how to do that. And I'm, I haven't heard of uh, like any of the hardware manufacturers commenting on them or saying like we're going to implement this one. So still very much in a holding pattern um, on how we do that because the, the signature aggregation I would say is the most important 
thing that we're interested in for our users because it will give them a much greater deal of on-chain privacy because you know under under the the right you know optimal happy conditions it's no longer even going to look like a multi-sig spend on chain and unfortunately you know with the nature of uh, bitcoin development it's hard for me to say you know when everything is going to fall into place uh, for us to be able to support that. Yeah. Cool. I didn't expect like a full blown date, but I just know with the collaborative capacity of like a very unique challenge, getting everything ready compared to every other wallet manufacturer. So I appreciate it. It is um, though, you know, there's always going to be workarounds. Uh, for example, if you had a, a key set where, um, all but one of your devices uh, supported some new functionality, then you can either, in, in Casa, you can either rotate that key out, which of course requires sweeping the funds of the wallet, or if you have that seed phrase, um, you can always just load it onto a different uh, manufacturer device that does support the functionality. Yeah, that's a good point. Thanks. Okay, and we have one more question. Um, if we can go ahead. Please, RMB, feel free. Okay, <laughs> he's just dropped off. Um, I suppose we, we don't really have a queue here, so I guess most of the questions have been answered, which is great. <laughs> um, I s again, thank you very much, uh, Jameson, for joining. If you have any parting words, maybe, um, please feel free to go ahead. Yeah, I guess the main thing is, um, you know, we've talked about a lot of things. Uh, I think it's pretty clear this is a very complex space. Um, just don't be overwhelmed. Uh, you know, you, you don't have to be an expert and spend all day, every day worrying about this stuff. Uh, just take it uh, one little bit at a time. <laughs> yeah, I guess everyone's been through ups and downs of different proportions, and uh, yeah, it can be it can be overwhelming. But time goes on, number goes up, and <laughs> we we get over it. I suppose um, just need to look out for yourself. So thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I'm going to end this now, and thanks a lot again for Jameson and all of our speakers and all the questions and. Uh, this is the last space um, that we've been running for Cybersecurity Month. We'll be putting out a recording of this as well and the other two that we had earlier, um, the previous two weeks. So um, if you missed the earlier parts of the, of the, of the session, or, um, you can always catch up with it there. It will be on YouTube within about a week. Um, so again, thanks for joining, and yeah, good night to everyone, or good morning, good day, etc. So, uh, Jameson as well, <laughs> you, you might want to say goodbye. All right. Thanks for listening. Bye. <laughs>